Uh, but I've, I've got a, a really important message here tonight. It's something that I haven't really spoken on much since I've been here uh, in Visalia. I don't think I've ever done sort of a Halloween expose themed message since I've been here. I've done several uh, as a pastor, but I don't think I've taught any uh, uh, exposes on Halloween since I've been here in Visalia. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23, sort of as a springboard. This is not really um, along the lines of our expository chapter by chapter, verse by verse study through Revelation, but this is um, um, a scripture that we could start with and we could kind of go from there. Uh, in Revelation 18 and verse 23, and I've entitled tonight, tonight's message, Let Your Light Shine, a Halloween expose. So that's the title. Let your light shine, a Halloween expose. What does the Bible have to say, or does the Bible have anything to say about Halloween? So Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. We read, The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. The word sorcery there is what we're really going to be kind of focusing on here uh, tonight. So as we know, we've been studying Revelation 18, of course, about the Antichrist's false religious system, Mystery Babylon, uh, uh, the great, we're told, in uh, Revelation 17, verse 5. Um, and mystery Babylon would be the roots of all uh, of the occult practices and divination, um, astrology, um, seances, necromancy, calling up the dead, uh, and so forth. And so um, we are looking tonight at this idea, and, and really they all find the roots in mystery Babylon. These are the mystery religions, uh, and, and uh, we, we are going to be looking at that uh, this evening. But this is, tonight we're looking at, um, in, in chapter 18, the governmental system of the Antichrist, but even in the Antichrist government and in his economy, uh, it says that through his sorcery or through his witchcraft, all the nations were deceived. And so witchcraft, sorcery, the practice of sorcery, we'll look at the root word in a minute, um, is, is being condemned by God as being a deception, a, a way that Satan is going to deceive the masses uh, during the tribulation period to uh, uh, basically to follow the devil and to worship the devil. Not everyone's going to go along with it, but it's going to be a capital offense for those who refuse to worship the Antichrist and worship the dragon, as we know. Um, Revelation chapter 9 speaks about the fact that it's not just um, the false prophet and the Antichrist who are pushing sorcery. Uh, sorcery is being practiced by those during the tribulation period. We read in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent or turn away from Re repent of means you're, you're, you're turning away from that. You're no longer doing these things. You're no longer practicing these things. You're repenting of it, and you're turning, and you're going another way. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues during the tribulation period did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And, verse 21 of Revelation 9, they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries. There we have sorcery again, practiced during the tribulation period by the inhabitants of the earth, or of their sexual immorality or their thefts. And so uh, we know that in the last days, as we believe that we are living in the last days, uh, the Bible predicts that there's going to be a huge in, uh, increase in the uh, practice and popularity um, of, the, uh, of the occult and the practice of the occult. Um, and ultimately, 
the practice of Satanism, because really all witchcraft and divination and astrology um, ultimately find their roots in Satan and in the fallen angelic host, the fallen angels. And we know that the Bible tells us that in the last days, uh, for example, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And so if we were living in the last days, we would expect to see uh, deceiving spirits we'd, uh, on the scene. We'd, we'd expect to see doctrines of demons uh, um, popularized and, and actually even promoted uh, from the pulpits of the so-called uh, churches in the last days with the false teachers and who uh, tickle uh, the ears of the people and tell them what they want to hear instead of telling them the truth and telling them the word of God. We're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the Antichrist and his um, false prophet, the miracle working, signs and wonder working false prophet. He says, uh, we read in verse 9, Paul the Apostle says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the coming of the lawless one, this is the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So in the last days, you're going to see uh, the, the uh, lawless one, is, as Satan is getting ready to come onto the scene, we would expect to see uh, more uh, people looking for signs, looking for wonders, uh, looking for power. And oftentimes that's why people go into witchcraft it, to begin with is for power. Often they've been jaded, they've been burned by somebody, and they want to get even. And that's kind of the entryway uh, through the door, and they want to be able to put hexes and spells and curses on people, uh, and it's the open door uh, into the occult. But this is what Satan's kingdom is going to be defined by. Uh, signs, deception, lying wonders, the practice of sorcery and of the occult. Jesus tells us the same thing uh, in the Sermon or rather the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, Jesus says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So people uh, purportedly speaking for God or speaking with authority from God um, who are deceiving people and turning them away from the truth of God's word and turning them towards uh, the devil and, and teaching them um, things that are contrary to, to the word of God, false prophets, false teachers. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, in your New Testament. Ephesians 5 verse 1 says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And clearly he's speaking to us as Christians, to the church. He says, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication, which is all sex outside of marriage, basically just following sexual lust and fulfilling your sexual lust outside of a monogamous, heterosexual, one-man, one-woman marriage. He says, but fornication and all sexual uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. Coarse jesting is um, a Bible term for dirty joking, telling dirty jokes and laughing at dirty jokes. No coarse jesting, which is not fitting for the Christian. He says, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator... Someone practicing sex outside of God's prescribed uh, purpose for marriage and, and, and uh, sex within marriage for a monogamous heterosexual marriage. Anything outside of that is fornication. For this you know, no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And of course, uh, the... A Greek word for fornication or fornicator, it comes from the root word porneo, 
uh, from which we get the English word pornography. So this would even include those who are looking at pornography to satisfy their sexual urges and their sexual lusts. So again, for this you know, no fornicator, sexually unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. It's a contradictory lifestyle to the Christian lifestyle. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Those who are practicing these things, the unbelievers who are practicing these things. He says in verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. So we could stop right there. So he's saying walking in darkness is basically living as a fornicator, uh, as someone who is uh, sexually unclean, who is covetous, greedy, coveting what other people have, jealous, um, filthiness, nonsense talking, like a lot of what's online, nonsense talking, just just talking for the sake of talking, but it's just, there's no point. It's foolish talking, nonsense, coarse jesting, telling dirty jokes, enjoying dirty jokes. Um, an idolater, verse 5, someone who uh, worships anything other than God. Uh, he says, these are the deeds of darkness. The sons of disobedience practice these things. Don't be partakers with them. This is darkness. You're children of light, contrarily to the Christian. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. That should define us, not the deeds of darkness, but the deeds of light, goodness, righteousness, truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That's what we're doing in church. We study the Word of God, we learn the Word of God, and then we attempt to practice living out what we're learning from God's Word, finding out what pleases God and then doing it. That's what we are called to do. That's living in the light of Jesus Christ in a very dark world. Then he says in verse 11, Ephesians 5, and have no fellowship or camaraderie with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to expose some of the unfruitful works of darkness tied in with the um, secular celebration of All Hallows Eve, uh, which has uh, became known uh, and has become known as Halloween. He says, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things, verse 13, that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, that means very cautiously, very carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we're called children of light. We are called to walk as children of light. We're told we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And if anything, our job is to shine the light so that we can expose them, the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. And we are definitely in a backwards, completely backwards society and generation where good is bad and bad is good and evil is called righteous, and righteousness is called evil, and all the rest. We're certainly living in a post-Christian uh, generation. This, you know, um, what defines us now uh, as a population of, uh, of the human race is really uh, pure Satanism, because again, Satanism, Satanism is do what thou wilt, whatever you want, do whatever you want, and that is the whole of the law. In other words, do anything you want, do everything you want, do whatever you want. That is Satanism. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us this about the last day's satanic generation that's going to usher in and worship the Antichrist. But know this, 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in the last days, perilous times will come, treacherous times, difficult times, for men will be lovers of themselves. 
We're not called to love ourselves first. We're called to love God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. The second commandment isn't to love yourself. The second commandment is to love others as you love yourself. But in the last days, self-love is going to define the human race before the Antichrist comes to power. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud. This is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. Blasphemers, taking the names Lord in vain, cursing the name of God, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. This is what a post-Christian era looks like. It's defined by 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, and I would say as you look at that, uh, we see that this defines our nation, sadly, uh, uh, is this list of the perilous times of the last day. People are lovers of themselves. They're lovers of money. They're boasters. They're proud. They're blasphemers. They're disobedient to their parents. They're unthankful. They're entitled. They believe the world owes them a living. They're unholy. They're unloving. The only person they love is themselves. They're unforgiving. They're slanderers. They curse people and, and, and put people down. They have no self-control. They're brutal. They're despisers of things that are good. They're traitors. They're dishonest. They're treacherous. You can't trust them. They're headstrong, haughty, and they love pleasure, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. They love pleasure to feed the flesh rather than loving God. So again, when we look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20, and we see that this sorcery and idolatry is going to be one of the things that defines the Antichrist kingdom and the population during the Antichrist kingdom, uh, we have to kind of drill down a little bit on, on what this means. Again, Revelation 9 and verse 20 says that they did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons. And then he goes on to talk about idols, gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood. So the little idol that people worship, let's say the, the Hindus, the Pali, uh, not the Hindus, yes, the Hindus. I got it mixed up the other night. The Buddhists are pantheists. The Buddhists believe everything is God and believe in reincarnation. Um, not at all Christianity or anything close to what the Bible teaches. Um, pantheism, everything is God. It's what the Buddhists believe. The Hindus believe in polytheism, which is many gods, a multitude of gods. And uh, last count I heard, they had 350 million gods uh, for the Hindus. They add gods all the time to the Hindu uh, pantheon of gods that they worship. But now they say they have 350 million gods. And oftentimes they set up statues. They set up idols of uh, Vishnu and all these other Hindu statues, all these weird, creepy things, uh, half animal, half humans, and all the rest. And they worship them, literally worship them. They offer them sacrifices, and they give them food and so forth, and they pray to them, and, and uh, they treat them as deity. They treat them as, as gods. Well, the Bible says they're demons. They're worshiping demons as they worship idols. So behind the idol is a demonic power. This is what uh, John is telling us here in Revelation chapter 9. So they didn't repent of their idolatry, their worship of demons. And verse 21 of Revelation 9, they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their porneo, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So again, the Greek word for sorceries here uh, in the New Testament is a word pharmakeia. Pharmakeia uh, means sorcery. Um, it's, there's also pharmakus or pharmakahus, uh, uh, which is a, uh, one who is a practitioner of pharmakeia. And the definition is very interesting because, of course, we know we get our English word pharmacy um, or pharmacist from this word in the Greek pharmakeia. And so it has something to do, obviously, with someone uh, taking uh, drugs or dispensing drugs. Uh, and we understand that in our culture, you get, a, you, know, you get sick, you go to the doctor, they write you a script, you go to the pharmacy, they give you a drug, you take the drug, and hopefully you feel better. Uh, and that's how we understand pharmacy in our culture. It's a positive thing for the most part. 
Uh, although pretty much it seems like every doctor you go to, it's always the answer is always to write a script and give you a drug and keep you on that drug uh, as long as possible. I mean, it's so sad you see so many seniors and they've got shoebox, uh, shoeboxes full of pills and drug bottles that they have 15, 20 bottles of pills and the doctor tells them they have to stay on these drugs for the rest of their life and um, you probably need a second opinion and find another doctor if they're telling you that you have to take the same pills you were taking when you were 50 now that you're 80. But they just leave you on those drugs forever and put them on autopilot, auto refill, oftentimes because uh, sadly, um, you know, the doctors do get, uh, in some way, shape, or form, they get compensated for the drugs that they prescribe from the drug companies, even though they're not supposed to, when trips and so forth. But the literal definition of the Greek word pharmakeia, again from uh, Strong's concordance, exhaustive concordance, is this. Pharmakeia is a spell-giving potion, um, or it is the practice of magic, uh, or it is someone who is a druggist who is dispensing of spell-giving potions, literally one of the definitions is someone who is a poisoner, that they're poisoning people with drugs, a magician or a practitioner of magic, or a sorcerer, someone who practices sorcery and witchcraft. So when the Bible says they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries, we're talking about those who are either, you know, uh, using mind-altering drugs or giving someone, selling someone uh, mind-altering drugs uh, for them to uh, experiment with or to use uh, to enter into an altered state of consciousness or uh, a, a practitioner of magic or sorcery. Um, often, uh, the practice of magic, even in modern times, uh, is accompanied with the use of strong hallucinogenics. Um, even strong alcohol. You remember back in the day. You don't see it anymore. I don't see it anymore. But back when I was a kid, and really even after that, you used to see on liquor stores, on the, on the storefront, it said beer, wine, and spirits. It didn't say beer, wine, and liquor. It said beer, wine, and spirits. Because throughout human history, people have understood that if you drink enough strong liquor, you turn into another person. There's another spirit that takes over your body and you're not even yourself anymore. Sometimes people even black out and they don't even know what they did. They have no idea what they did and it's very dangerous because you're opening yourself up to the demonic realm to even be possessed by demons when you're in that altered state of consciousness uh, through the use of strong alcohol, um, drugs, hallucinogenics. But for the idea of, of sorcery in the Bible, it is, it is tied into witchcraft. It's the use of strong hallucinogenics, strong alcohol, for the purpose of entering into an altered state of consciousness so that you can make contact with the unseen world. We see this all over the world with shamans and medicine men and witch doctors. Still to this day, uh, there are places in the world uh, where they use uh, hallucinogenics for the purpose of entering into an altered state of consciousness so that they can then enter into the spirit realm and they could receive information and make contact with spirits. And that is what a shaman was and is, the medicine man. Um, it is uh, very interesting that much of the um, drugs that used to be illegal in this country uh, because we were protecting people from entering into and opening doors into the spiritual realm, uh, the fallen spiritual realm, um, we've legalized these drugs in California and, and all the more. Uh, LSD is about to be legalized here in California. It's already available uh, for um, drug studies and, and so forth. Uh, ketamine is legal in, in, in California. Ketamine is a horse tranquilizer. And uh, you enter into a wacky uh, uh, state of consciousness uh, when you take ketamine, uh, apparently. Um, mushrooms are legal now in California. Magic mushrooms. Uh, Cytosilbian, I think it is. Um, or psilocybin, something like this. You can look it up. Not now, but after. Um, it, it's, it's the psycho ingredient within magic mushrooms that creates people to hallucinate 
or to enter into an altered state of consciousness. So ketamine is legal, shrooms are legal, LSD is about to be legal, pot, of course, is legal, marijuana. And, you know, back in the day, hemp plants that George Washington grew and smoked did not get you high. Hemp was used as a very valuable plant uh, for making uh, garments, for making clothes. It was very strong um, um, you know, sort of a, a, a weed that they could weave together. They used them for ropes uh, for the uh, sailing ships, uh, and, and they used them even in uh, the rigging and the harnesses of sails, uh, th this hemp, because it was so strong when you would weave it, the hemp plant. Um, they would smoke it, but there was no THC. The THC levels were so minimal in hemp that was grown naturally in the wild. You could not get high if you wanted to by smoking hemp. So they would just smoke it kind of as, you know, like smoking a, a tobacco pipe or something like that at the end of, of the day. Uh, but it wasn't something that they did to get high. George Washington was not a stoner. He wasn't high on weed or pot or whatever they call it these days. Um, and uh, hemp is not the same thing as marijuana. Marijuana is a hybrid of hemp. Marijuana is man's attempt to take hemp to find the, the uh, strains of hemp that have the highest levels of THC and to crossbreed them with other uh, uh, high THC hemp plants. And so it's a man-made invention. And now you have the chemists involved. And so now they say that the marijuana that people smoke today is 50 to 100 times stronger than the marijuana was that people smoked in the 60s and in the 70s in this country. The rat weed, as they used to call it. Um, now they're using all sorts of uh, science and uh, you know, uh, chemistry to literally infuse marijuana with THC, which is the psychoactive ingredient which causes people to enter, to, enter into an altered state of consciousness uh, and to begin to hallucinate. And so all these things are now legal um, in California and, and throughout much of the country. And the use of these drugs, it, it kind of thins the veil, as it were, between the physical and the spiritual realm. And that is why the shamans use it, the medicine, the witch doctors, uh, for the purpose of making contact, breaking through that veil and, and making contact with the spirit realm. Very, very dangerous to uh, play uh, with those uh, drugs. I want to read to you a little bit of history about Halloween. And you'll see that Halloween, as innocent as it may seem... Halloween has its roots fixedly, uh, f fixed on, its roots are fixed on the occult and on paganism. That's where it comes from. Uh, this is uh, an article from Library of Congress. So it's not a Christian article, to say the least, from Library of Congress. It says, the origins and traditions of Halloween. I'll read some of it to you. Carving pumpkins, trick-or-treating, and wearing scary costumes are some of the time-honored traditions of Halloween. Yet the Halloween holiday has its roots in the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. It looks like Samhain, but it's pronounced Samhain, actually S-A-M-H-I-N, but it's pronounced Samhain. It's a Gaelic word. It's a pagan religious celebration to welcome the harvest at the end of summer when people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off ghosts. In the 8th century, Pope Gregory III designated November 1st as a time to honor the saints. Soon after, All Saints Day came to incorporate some of the traditions of Samhain, the Celtic Druid, Druidic pagan holiday. The evening before All Saints Day was known as All Hallows' Eve and later Halloween. Here is a look at the origins of some of the classic Halloween traditions we know today. Jack-o'-lanterns. The, the traditional carving of jack-o'-lanterns originated in Ireland using turnips instead of pumpkins. It is allegedly based on a legend about a man named Stingy Jack 
who repeatedly trapped the devil and only let him go on the condition that Jack would never go to hell. But when Jack died, he learned that heaven didn't want his soul either. So he was forced to wander the earth as a ghost for all eternity. The devil gave Jack a burning lump of coal in a carved out turnip to light his way. Locals eventually began carving scary faces into their own turnips to frighten away evil spirits. So that's the roots of the jack-o'-lantern. Um, seeing ghosts. The festival uh, marked the transition to the new year at the end of the harvest and the beginning of the winter. Celtic people believed that during the festival, spirits walked the earth. Later on, Christian missionaries introduced All Souls Day on November 2nd, after All Saints Day, I guess, on November 1st, which perpetrated the idea of the living coming into contact with the dead around the same time of the year. This is why in Mexico and South American countries, they celebrate the Day of the Dead, the Dia de los Muertos, right? Muertos, looking at my wife, making sure I'm pronouncing the Spanish correctly. The Day of the Dead, huge celebration for, for, for the Mexican culture, uh, especially with the Roman Catholicism. Um, wearing scary costumes, why do we, people dress up and wear scary costumes on Halloween? Well, in order, to be, uh, uh, in order to avoid being terrorized by all the evil spirits walking the earth during Samhain, Samhain, the Celts donned disguises in order to confuse the spirits so that they would leave them alone. So that's the root of the scary costumes because it was the day of the dead and there was all kinds of spirits walking and ghosts all over the place, scary things. You'd have to be scary to scare them off. And so they would dress in scary costumes. Um, Trick-or-treating. Um, during Samhain, the Celtic people would leave food out to appease the spirits that were traveling the earth at night. And over time, people began to dress as these unearthly beings in exchange for similar offerings of food and drink. So they would leave out food or put out something for the spirits to leave them alone uh, because they were scared of them. And this is where we get the idea of trick or treating. Uh, let's see. Uh, pranking. Playing pranks often varies by region. But the pre-Halloween tradition known as the Devil's Night is credited to a different origin depending on the source. Some say that pranks started as part of May Day celebrations, but Samhain and eventually All Souls Day also included good-natured mischief. When Irish and Scottish immigrants came to America, they brought with them the tradition of celebrating Mischief Night as part of Halloween. Uh, lighting candles and bonfires. For much of early history of Halloween, towering bonfires were used to light the way for souls seeking the afterlife. These days, lighting candles have gener generally replaced the large traditional blazes. And bonfires literally comes from the name bone fires because they would make giant fires with bones primarily, not just wood, but bones and wood uh, bone fire became bonfire in order to ward off the evil spirits. So there's more here, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But it, it is very interesting. Again, the roots of Halloween are secular. They're not Christian. The Catholic Church tried to Catholicize and Christ, Christian stamp, as it were, stamp Christianity upon this holiday in the 8th century A.D. But it has always been a purely uh, pagan holiday. It's also a celebration of darkness. It's a celebration of death. And it's a celebration of ghosts and witches and haunted houses and scary things. Some people, like Wiccans, or those who practice witchcraft, or those who practice sorcery, sorcerers, those who practice the occult, like psychics, 
and Satanists, they take Halloween very, very seriously. Halloween is probably their most holy day of the year, I would think, uh, for the occult calendar. There's many practices of the occult and many different variations of uh, the mystery religions that find their roots in mystery Babylon uh, that have different high holy days, like uh, the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, or the summer solstice, where they worship the sun, the longest day of the year, or the spring or fall equinoxes, where it's the exact time of daylight and night, you know, 12 hours of day, 12 hours night, exactly on that day. They have celebrations, they offer sacrifices, they do spells and things like this on these days. But I would say that at least with modern Satanism and modern witchcraft in the West, Halloween is probably their highest holy day where they practice rites, rituals, seances, trying to make contact with the dead, trying to call up the dead or call up spirits, uh, and also uh, for the casting of spells and hexes and the practice of witchcraft. And it's interesting that, you know, they say that the spells and the witchcraft that they do on Halloween has more power on that day than any other day of the year. And uh, apparently they really believe this. It's interesting that we would think that that's happening somewhere else, but this is happening right here in Visalia. The practice of witchcraft and the occult is just um, really growing rapidly here in this valley, even in the city in, in, in just the last few years that I've noticed even as a pastor. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Barnes & Noble that is right over here in Visalia, um, they have a very prominent display once again of their books on witchcraft and on the occult. When you walk in there, uh, Tommy sent me a picture of this uh, this morning. He was in the, in the store or whatever at Barnes & Noble over here on, on Mooney, and he sent me this picture with this display of all of these books on witchcraft and on the occult. Uh, some of the titles include um, The Spirit Kitchen, uh, Recipes for Rituals for the Wheel of the Year, or Alchemy Elementals, or Nikfit School, or The Witch's Apothecary, or Plant Magic for the Beginner Witch, or The Angel Bible, or The Lost Spells, or The Full Moon Cookbook, or The Complete Book of Witchcraft. On and on it goes. Ordinary Mysticism. Um, the occult, one is just called the occult, uh, decoding the, the visual culture of mysticism, magic, and divination. It has a triangle with the eye, the eye of Horus inside the triangle uh, on the cover of the book. A modern witchcraft, natural magic, boxed set, M-A-G-I-C-K, the way they spell magic. Witches, forest, and then the occult book, a chronological journey from alchemy to Wicca, with the star of, of the Wiccans uh, right there on the front. And that's just a few of the titles there. That's just down the street. That's what they're prominently displaying and no doubt selling uh, left and right uh, to uh, our uh, community, those who live here in our backyard. I was just floored. My wife was going through looking at events on the Facebook calendar seeing what's coming up and, and so forth here in the fall locally. And she found all of these different um, spiritual community witchcraft um, gatherings taking place. And I was shocked that they are promoting that they're holding seances here in our backyard. Seances is calling up the dead. It's called necromancy in the Bible. Uh, one of them is going to be, well, actually... It's Saturday, October 26th at 6 p.m. So it was just this last Saturday. Uh, they say the location is to be disclosed upon payment. So they're not publicly identifying where they're going to have this event. Uh, it's called a spiritual community rendezvous, a Halloween spirit, uh, spiritual celebration. Join the Crystal Barn for an enchanting evening of food, fellowship, crafts, and more. This is an outdoor event that will include a potluck, potluck craft, 
bonfire and will end, so it seems innocent enough, right? A potluck, do some crafts, a bonfire. And it will end with a seance, it says, led by Aaron and Jesse, whoever they are. Admission is $20 a person. Cash or Venmo space is limited. And then uh, there's another one. This is just one of them. There's another one that's called Keyword Tarot. And I think that Crystal Barn store, I believe, is in Tulare. I, I, I think it's in Tulare. This is Keyword Tarot. This is Sunday, November 3rd. Uh, this is Aaron's Essential Magical Series presented by Aaron Davenport. Event details. Learn tarot. These are the tarot cards that are supposed to, occult tarot cards are supposed to tell you your future. Learn tarot the easy way with a keyword system based on numerology and elemental interactions and memorization techniques for the major arcana. Great for beginners and advanced readers alike. These are readers as, as in palm readers or those who crystal ball readers, psychics. Uh, again, this is at the Crystal Barn. This one is the Crystal Barn in Visalia. It's $40 a person, uh, and it is um, November 3rd. <clears throat> and let me see. They give some more details here. So what to expect? This is all on Facebook. It's not, you know, you could find this for yourself. What to expect? A spiritist medium circle, or misa, is a beautiful service which gives us the opportunity to connect with our loved ones who have passed away, contacting the dead, and contact those spiritual beings and guides who will walk with us and help us in our daily lives, whether we are aware of them or not. So they're looking to contact, you know, old Grandpa Joe and call him up from his, you know, cold tomb or whatever, but they'll take any spirit that wants to show up at these seances, an enlightened spirit or enlightened ascended master or whatever they want to call themselves. They're completely opening themselves up to deception by the demonic spiritual realm. It says it's $40 a person. Reservations are required. And to secure your spot, full payment is required in advance. Walk-ins cannot be accommodated. Thank you for your understanding. And they're not telling you uh, where this one is. It's going to be uh, basically revealed to them at the last moment after they kind of give the thumbs up. And no doubt because they want to keep out people perhaps like us who would want to go and challenge it or we'd want to go and oppose it or maybe we want to go and pray against it because if you have Christians that are praying against it, probably nothing is going to manifest itself because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. But this is all happening right here in Visalia and in Tulare. Uh, there's, there's more, but there, there, here's the third one. This is for astral travel. This is like out-of-body experiences, learning how to leave your body and travel around the universe, astral travel. Expand your consciousness, it says. In person, in Visalia, pre-registration is required. That's Sunday, November 24th, astral travel that was uh, put on by the path to enter uh, or inner peace, it says. What to expect? Astral travel is the art and science of expanding one's consciousness to gain knowledge. The astral plane is the plane of limitless learning and understanding. Without proper guidance, one could do more harm than good in practicing astral travel. In this workshop, you will learn to do so well and safely to expand your knowledge of yourself and your godhood, that you are God. Learn about you being God is what they're saying here when you go to do this class on astral travel. Sacred, sacred Geometry 1 class, same day at 9.30 a.m., is highly recommended for a better astral travel experience. Bring with you a notebook, writing utensils, a water bottle if you like. Wear comfortable clothing as you will sit down for most of the class. And this is a prerequisite class for the Healers Academy and the Advanced Astral Travel. This is all, guys, this is all the occult, the practice of the occult and witchcraft, sorcery, right here in our backyard. Uh, one more, the sacred geometry that he mentioned, sacred geometry number one. The three keys to heaven is the subtitle. Uh, in person, in Visalia, pre-registration is required. 
Uh, this actually took place already. Oh, no, it's going to take place Sunday, November 24th, it says. Um, and I'm just giving you names so you can avoid uh, these places from now on. This is going to be held at the Oak Street Studios Fitness in Visalia. So if you have a membership to the Oak Street Studios Fitness Club, you should probably quit it because it's run by witches uh, and people who practice the occult. Uh, and they say about this, about these numbers, the sacred geometry, numerology, says it's important to pay attention to your surroundings when you want to get clarity and do what you need to do. Inner chaos creates outer disorders, and outer disorders solidifies inner chaos. In addition to being physically decluttered, an energetically clean space will help you relax and create better. In this sacred geometry one class, you'll receive ancient knowledge and techniques, quote-unquote, rituals from the mystery school traditions to protect and set up your space in a way that fosters productivity, creativity, and relaxation. You will also learn about the basic shapes of creation, learn the language of the universe, so you're able to communicate your desires for better manifestation. This class is both esoteric, which is ancient knowledge, and practical, time-tested rituals to use every day. Notice that the author says that you're going to receive ancient knowledge and rituals from the mystery school traditions. Remember what we read in Revelation chapter 18 or 17 in verse 5 about Babylon? Mystery Babylon the Great, the Bible calls her. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. They're still practicing the Babylonian mystic religions today, just called something different. It's much more modernized and sanitized and socially acceptable, not just in our country, but in our city. This is in Visalia. And there's more than one seance taking place. I just put one in here. Uh, but there are, I think, three seances that are, that are being advertised that are taking place. Some of them are seances that they're doing on a monthly or a, or a weekly even basis for people who want to contact the spirit realm. So some people take this very, very seriously. A lot of people just have fun with Halloween and they you know, dress their kids up as a princess or a knight or a baseball player, an astronaut or whatever. Um, and they go around knocking on doors to get candy. And, you know, it, it, is, it is fairly innocent in, in that sense. We sort of kind of westernized it here to uh, make it palatable for us. And now they tell us Halloween is the second biggest uh, holiday for retail sales, second only to Christmas. They sell so much junk and stuff for Halloween and candy, obviously, but also all the stuff people put on their front yards and, and everything else, all their displays and everything, uh, that now Halloween is number two to Christmas in popularity from retail sales and money that is earned. And most people, you know, they don't take it very seriously. They, they don't think about any of this, obviously. Most of us have never thought about this. But there are witches and warlocks and people that practice the occult and practice sorcery who take this very, very seriously. Seances, tarot card readings, trying to tell you your future. Astrology, looking to the stars, the, the signs of the zodiac, the horoscope. Again, looking to the stars to try and find your future. Astral travel, leaving your body to go and travel around outside of your body, an out-of-body experience, uh, and sacred geometry, or uh, occult numerology. These things are being taught and practiced here uh, in our backyard. Now, the Bible forbids the practice of witchcraft. It's so clear. And again, I'm not saying that you can't dress your kid up as a princess and take him trick-or-treating. That's not what I'm saying. Let it, the Bible says, let every man be fully convinced in your own mind. So you've got to be fully convinced if that's something you want to do or not do. It's up to you. You may say, I don't have a problem with it doesn't really bother me. I'm not into all this, and my kids aren't into all this, and we have fun, and that's between you and God. I'm not saying you can't, you can't give out trick-or-treat candy at Halloween on your front door. I, I'm not saying that. But the Bible forbids, clearly forbids, the practice of witchcraft. And it's very interesting that the first king of Israel basically was a rebel, King Saul, against God. And he rebelled, and he rebelled, and he rebelled against God, disobeyed God, disobeyed God, disobeyed God, did his own thing. 
And eventually God told him, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to a man uh, who's more righteous than you, who's more worthy than you, uh, to David, uh, the shepherd boy who became the king. Samuel the prophet told King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 in verse 22, after Samuel rebelled again against God's commands, or not Samuel, but Saul, King Saul rebelled against God's commands. Samuel was the prophet. So Samuel said to King Saul, 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the Lord, obeying God's word, obeying his voice? Behold, to obey God is better than to give God a sacrifice. God's more interested in our obedience to his word than he is in our religious sacrifices or uh, our religious rites and rituals. He says in verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And the Lord ripped away the kingdom from Saul and gave it to David. But notice that God attributes disobedience to, uh, or, or witchcraft to disobedience and, and vice versa. He says they're one and the same. Disobedience, rebellion against God, rebellion against the authorities that God has put in our lives uh, is a form of witchcraft. Uh, it is doing our own thing uh, in clear defiance of what God tells us we should and should not be doing. It is very interesting that after God uh, pronounces this judgment upon Saul, that toward the end of Saul's life, he actually consults a witch to hold a seance. This is the king of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 3, we read this. Now Samuel, this is the prophet of God, Samuel had died. And all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put out the mediums and the spiritists, those who practice witchcraft and practice the occult, he'd put them out of the land. Then the Philistines, verse 4, 1 Samuel 28, gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by the Urim or by the prophets. God had stopped talking to Saul because Saul was a rebel and he was going to do his own thing anyways. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium or a witch, the witch of Endor, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium or a witch at Endor. So Saul disguised himself, verse 8. He put on other clothes. He went, and two other men went with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one who I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, the king, because remember, Saul has uh, disguised himself. She says, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul Saul swore to her by the Lord. (laughs) He's like, I swear by God that, you know, I'm not going to do anything to you if you help me have a seance. I mean, it just shows you how lost Saul was at this point at the end of his life. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing, Saul told her. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. He wants to actually have a seance to call up the spirit of the prophet Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And literally it means she was terrified. She was scared to death. Because no doubt most of what she did was smoke and mirrors and she was fooling people just like most psychics are just, they're just charlatans ripping people off because it's easy money, honestly. People are so dumb to pay money to go and have somebody read your palm and pay them $500 to tell them what a great life you're going to have from this point on. It doesn't mean that any of it's going to happen, any of it's going to be true, but they still get your money up front. So she saw Samuel there 
and she was terrified. The woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. Instantly she understood that this was King Saul calling up the prophet Samuel. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid, indicating that she was greatly afraid or he wouldn't have said that. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, He's an old man. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and he bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has already departed from you, and the Lord has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. And because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, no ex- execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. In other words, you're going to be dead by this time tomorrow, and your sons. This is the only example in the Bible that we have of a seance where someone is actually really called up from the dead. That is called an exception to the rule. How many people pitch, it's the World Series, right? How many people pitch a no-hitter, a perfect game? It's very, very rare to pitch a no-hitter. That's the exception to the rule. How many people bowl a 300 game, a perfect game? Every, every single for 10 or whatever it is, 10 balls, you get 10 strikes and you have a 300 score. It's, it's not the rule. That's the exception to the rule. And so the exception is not the rule. The exception proves the rule. With Saul calling up the spirit of Samuel. The Lord allowed this to happen because it was once again, it, Samuel was the first prophet of God in the Bible. Samuel. Saul was the first king of Israel in the Bible. So it's kind of significant. It's the beginning of a nation. And God allowed Samuel to come up from Abraham's bosom, which was in the heart of the earth. It's where the righteous dead went. Remember Luke 16, Jesus said there was a place prior to the cross of Calvary where the righteous dead went. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esther and Daniel and David and Samuel and all the righteous dead went to a basically a holding place where there was comfort in the heart of the earth, awaiting Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And then they were freed to go to heaven after Christ atoned for their sins. But they were in a, a holding place in the heart of the earth. There was also a place where the wicked went, which is a place called hell, that was a place of fire and pain, and anguish, and thirst, and suffering. Luke 16, Jesus details that for us. And so Samuel was permitted to come up this one time to pronounce judgment against King Saul and the nation of Israel because Saul was a complete rebel. And uh, God's judgment was upon him, and Samuel delivered that message. That doesn't mean that seances are calling up the dead of your lost loved ones. The Bible says that when people have seances, they're not calling up dead people. They're calling up demons. They're calling up deceiving spirits who may know a little bit about that dead person um, and may be able to tell a few things about that dead person to establish credibility. And then often they give messages of what you're supposed to do or where you're supposed to go or what have you. So this this, uh, necromancy that is recorded for us only one time in the Bible is the exception to the rule. It's not the rule. The exception to the rule proves the rule. And the rule is, is that you don't call up dead people with the seance because the dead people are in hell where they're awaiting final judgment or they're in heaven because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so there's no ghosts wandering around. There's no ghosts that are haunting houses There are spirits and demons that are haunting houses and that are around and that will be called up in a seance and that will possess 
the medium or the witch in order to give a message or what have you. But they are called deceiving spirits, lying spirits. And they use lying signs and wonders in order to establish credibility and in order to influence humankind, to affect humankind. Sam was the exception to the rule. It's like hitting a hole, a hole in one playing golf. I hit one hole in one. I was a kid. I think I was 10. And my dad wanted me to become a professional golfer because I hit a hole in one on a par three course in Pismo Beach. Um, it's the only hole in one I've ever hit. I don't play golf anymore, but, you know, uh, hitting a hole in one is the exception to the rule. You don't normally do it. It proves the rule. And uh, this uh, uh, example of Samuel coming up from the dead is a one-time example. It doesn't happen ever again. So we know that people who practice seances are not calling up dead people, the spirits or souls of, uh, of dead people. They are calling up demons. People use Ouija boards to contact spirits. People read tarot cards to contact spirits to divine their future. People use horoscopes and study astrology, the zodiac, in order to divine the future. They go to palm readers. They conduct seances. They have crystal balls read, all with the idea of contacting the spirit realm in order to get information, secret information about their future. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 7 quickly tells us about this practice. Leviticus 17 and verse 7 says, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generation. So when they were offering sacrifices to false gods, the Bible says they were offering sacrifices to demons, that the false gods of the nations are devils. They're demons. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, Moses says this in verse 16, he says, they provoked God to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons and not to God, to gods with a little g they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. So God calls all of the false gods that are worshipped, he calls them demons. All the false gods are demons, according to the Bible. In Leviticus and chapter 19 and verse 31, we're told, Give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits, and do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So God's people are not to be messing around with mediums, with seances, with witchcraft, with the occult. In Leviticus chapter 20, and verse 4, if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants, offering his descendants to Molech, human sacrifice, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family. I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits, witchcraft, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, we read in verse 9, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found anyone among you who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, that's human sacrifice, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, like the oracle of Delphi or something like that, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells. Again, this would be a witch or a, someone practicing Wiccan because they're conjuring spells. A spiritist. Or one who calls up the dead. That's a seance. These are forbidden. God says there shall not be found am among you anyone 
who does these things. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess listened to the soothsayers, the diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed you for such. And even in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle tells us that even the gods of the Romans and the Greeks behind the idols and behind the gods, you know, uh, Zeus and, and, and Mars and, and, and Venus and Diana and all these gods that they worship were demons. He says in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 10, what am I saying then, Paul says, that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the unbelieving Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. And so when you begin to uh, practice the occult or magic for beginners or whatever, or go to a seance thinking, hey, maybe it'll be cool. Or, you know, let's see what happens. Let's watch the show. Or let's just see if this spell actually works to get a better job or to make more money or to find a mate or whatever. The Bible says... This is forbidden for the child of God because ultimately behind this power is the demonic realm, the spirit realm, but the fallen spirit realm. You know, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to basically walk in the light as Christians. And, 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 and magic and witchcraft and sorcery and the practice of the occult is steeped in darkness. Matter of fact, you know, occult means something that was secret, that was forbidden, that is now being revealed. And oftentimes it's through spells and it's through potions and, and, and hexes and magic and even sacrifices, even human sacrifices, which is what Satanists practice. And ancient peoples all over the world, even to this day, some people still practice human sacrifice. It's again for the idea of power so that you can have power to influence other people's lives or have power over people's lives for prosperity, for wealth, for success, for victory against your enemies in war, or what have you. And it's, human sacrifice has been practiced throughout all of human history, uh, not just in the Old Testament times, even the Mayans, even the Incas, even the Aztecs, uh, right here in, in, in South America and Central America, uh, offered human sacrifice to their gods uh, in order to uh, make contact with the demonic realm and in order to receive secret knowledge from them uh, and power uh, from them. It is interesting that the satanic temple is still doing these satanic uh, ritual abortions. Uh, we looked at this last year for our uh, New Year's Eve prophecy update, but this is, this is a new one. Uh, this article is from October 15, 2024, uh, from the Blaze News Service, and it says, Satanic Temple opens abortion clinic in Virginia for its quote-unquote destructive ritual. The radical group has expanded its bloody ritual, threatening to make quote-unquote a lasting difference. After helping kill over 100 unborn babies in New Mexico at an average cost of $91 per head, the Satanic Temple has expanded its abortion enterprise into Virginia. The anti-Christian group based in Massachusetts announced on Saturday that it is now offering expectant mothers in the Old Dominion telehealth abortion services and possible travel assistance, noting that patients need only to cover the cost of abort abortion from its California-based partner pharmacy. While co-founder Lucian Greaves and other proponents of the radical group deny they actually worship demonic forces, indicating that theirs is effectively an atheistic leftist organization wearing the skin of a satanic cult that just happens to erect statues of Baphomet around Christmas time, the Virginia Death Dispensary, like the Temple's Samuel Alito's mom's satanic abortion clinic in New Mexico, blurs the lines between role-playing and the real thing. The ritual, which includes the abortion itself, spans the entirety of the pregnancy termination procedure, they say, the Satanic Temple says, for women seeking to snuff out the life growing inside of them. The Satanic Temple offers an abortion, abortion ritual, 
which it describes as a destructive ritual that serves as a protective rite. The stated purpose of this death ritual is to cast off notions of guilt, shame, and mental discomfort associated with the extermination of innocent life and to altogether affirm the choice. And this is a direct quote from them. Quote, The Satanic Temple's abortion ritual can be performed to address the definable concerns or to overcome unproductive feelings, says the ritual guideline. The ritual, which includes the abortion itself, spans the entirety of the pregnancy termination procedure. There are steps to be performed before, during, and after the medical or surgical abortion. The radical group makes repeated mention of individual rights and scientific reasoning on its site, suggesting that in the case of individual rights, quote, one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone, unquote. In other words, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, the first law in the satanic church. And in the case of scientific reasoning, that, quote, beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. Um, however, such statements amount to little more than the, uh, rhetorical smokescreen. After all, the Satanic Temple appears keen to overlook the rights of the unborn as well as scientific reasoning concerning fetal pain, fetal cognitive function, and the separate genetic identity of the unborn child. The Satanic Temple's ultimate goal from them, a quote from the Satanic Temple, is to undermine Christ's kingdom. That's their goal. That's their stated goal to undermine Christ's kingdom. Um, I could go on, but I won't for the sake of time. So yes, we are even in America, there are women who are offering their babies as a satanic sacrifice to Satan through the satanic temple with rites and rituals. Very, very scary stuff. Very scary. Uh, and, you know, God only knows what's going on behind closed doors that we're not aware of. This is all public knowledge of what's going on that's on the front pages of newspapers that I'm quoting to you. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Christians cannot be practicing these unfruitful works of darkness or even supporting them or endorsing them or accepting them, that it's normal and it's okay. Someone has to say that this is not okay. Someone has to say that we're not okay with people holding tarot classes and seances and astral travel and, uh, you know, um, sacred geometry and all of these things, you know. And, and we have to realize that these are, these are spirits of darkness that are being ushered into this valley. That's the idea. They're trying to open the doors to the demonic realm, to the spirit realm, whatever they want to call them, ascended masters or spirit guides or whatever. They're just deceiving spirits, using lying signs and wonders to get a following and also to influence humankind because these spirits don't have bodies. These demons don't have bodies. They have to use humans to get their will done on the earth. Romans chapter 13 tells us, and this is where we're going to end, verse 11, to the Christian. And do this, knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in sexual lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The only thing to do with the flesh is to kill it, mortify it, crucify it. Like Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. And we have to wake up every day and we have to choose. Are we going to feed the flesh and are we going to live for the lust of the flesh? Or are we going to crucify our flesh and live for Jesus and seek to be his people here on the earth? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, 
You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So Jesus tells you and me, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are children of the light. We're children of the day, not of the night, not of darkness. We're to put away the unfruitful works of darkness. We're not to be living uh, for especially uh, for the things that God condemns and God forbids. And again, this is just a little bit of a background on the history of Halloween. Again, for most people, Halloween is, is not a big occult ceremony or ritual. For most people, it's just something that everybody does, dress their kids up and take them trick-or-treating. Uh, but as Christians, this is why we do a harvest festival night, not a Halloween night here on October 31st. We do a celebration of Jesus, who is the light of the world. We do a celebration of light in the midst of a very, very dark night. And uh, so we will be here tomorrow night for our harvest night. It's also an opportunity as an outreach to reach out to the community so people can come here and have a little bit of a taste and see the goodness of God uh, here among us. Um, and also, it's a great alternative for Christian families who do not want to take their kids out trick-or-treating because they're convicted by the Holy Spirit that they don't want to have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, and they'd rather take them to a church where they could dress them up as something that's not evil. Again, dress them up like an astronaut or dress them up like a Bible character or dress them up like a princess, not a witch not a demon, not a devil with a pitchfork. Um, but come here, have fun, celebrate light and life and joy and peace. The kids are going to have a great time. They're going to get a lot of candy. They're going to get to play a bunch of games. And they're going to get to learn about Jesus, the light of the world. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you... Tell us everything that we need to know in your word, Lord. You, you, you don't hide it from us, Lord. It's there. You, you tell us about witchcraft. You tell us about seances. You, you tell us about those seeking to divine the future through tarot cards or through astrology, Lord. And you tell us these things are forbidden for the child of God. As a matter of fact, it was because the children of Israel practiced these things that you judged them and you carried them away captive to foreign lands because they were not representing you well. And so, Lord, we pray that we would represent you well as your people, Lord, that we would walk worthy of our calling, that we would let our light so shine that people would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven, that we will remember, Lord, where we came from, the darkness that you saved us from, Lord, that we would never want to go back to that in any way, shape, or form. And, Father, that we would be those who no longer practice the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, Lord, that we would be light and lights like a city set on a hill everywhere that we go, Lord God, that your light in us would be undeniable. So, Father, we do pray your blessing, your protection over our church tomorrow night with everyone coming here to uh, celebrate our harvest night and to celebrate Jesus, the light of the world. Uh, we pray, Father, you protect our, our homes, our families, our um, families, the marriages in our church, the children in our church, Lord God, that you would just put a hedge of protection around all of us, even around our community tomorrow night, Lord God. As all this stuff is going on, we pray against these forces of evil. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would rebuke the enemy. And Lord God, that you would give us victory over this dark night tomorrow night here in this valley, that they would not be successful in calling up any demons, Lord God, at their seances. You would shut it down, Lord. For there are people here uh, in this church that are praying against it, Lord God. We're interceding for our communities, Father God, that you would not allow these things to prosper. We pray no one would even show up for these things. No one would even sign up for them, Lord. And they'd move on to some other city and leave us alone. So Lord, bless us, watch over us, protect us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.